everybody, this is Roberto Blake helping you create something awesome today. Welcome to another YouTube Live Q&A. Um, happy Friday, everybody. Um, glad to see you guys here in the chat. Benjamin Brandon, how are you? Gildan Felix Vlogs, Lila, how are you? Painfully Honest Tech, Jason, how are you? We've got a great uh, Q&A session for you guys today. We're going to be talking about, it's going to be a lot of me reading legalese. So if you uh, were not interested in that, uh, it might be best to click off now. For those of you watching on the replay, welcome. Thank you so much. Feel free to drop comments. Feel free to drop a like. Share this information because we're going to be talking about YouTube's uh, content ID changes. I had to say it as copyright policy because that's what you guys are going to understand for layman's terms. But content ID is about um, your intellectual property as a YouTuber and whether uh, you can actually claw back either funds through a content ID claim of someone's ripping off your compilation videos or something like that, or your online content or your streams of your gameplay or your podcast, whatever, and repurposing it. Um, this is slightly different from copyright strikes and copyright takedowns, but we will talk about that. There are people who are mad critical of the YouTube copyright system, and there are legitimate criticisms to be made, but also I want to hold the creator community accountable for its massive ignorance of the agreements and the terms of use and the terms of service of the products they use, the community's ignorance of fair uses, proper applications, and copyright. I was a photographer and a graphic designer long before I was a YouTuber. I worked at an ad agency long before I was a YouTuber. And guess what? We had to deal with actual copyright and stock photo stuff and DCMA all the freaking time. And ignorance is not an excuse. It's not a defense. Fair use isn't even a defense when it comes to intellectual property theft. And what I want to do is I want to help YouTubers protect their content later, not today, but at some point I've made actual arrangements. I'm going to have interviews with lawyers on this channel and on my podcast channel that I'm starting up and we're going to really get some answers, some legit answers about this stuff because it's one of the most important issues for content creators uh, out there. So I definitely want to make sure that you guys are taken care of and you're protected. That's why I'm also going to read a lot of this stuff out loud for you. I'm going to read this stuff out loud for you. And yeah, there are changes that might need to be made to the system, but the law is the law and we all need to understand the law and the systems behind the tools that we use each and every day. And as a content creator, I don't want anyone stealing my crap and making money off of it. And I know you guys don't too. So we do need to be able to have some recourse to be able to, you know, have stuff if it's someone stealing our content we deserve to make the money on it they don't get to do that there should be fair use when transformative and commentary is done appropriately like in the case of the h3h3 example which most people will cite but most people citing that case fail to meet the standard because they i mean i'll be, I'll be real with you they kind of suck like so not everyone's as good as h3h3 so they're not meeting the standard of fur use properly but they want to use it as a defense right it's like sorry you're not good enough no eighth place trophies here get it right you know um so that's real and then i want you guys to be able to understand the proper applications of that so you can protect your content and then there's another side of it youtube for many people is becoming the way that they make their living or the way that they market or promote themselves or their business and um, Spencer, I disagree with you. Fair use is not common sense. It is a complicated issue. It's a very complicated issue. Ethan and Gila from H3H3 will tell you that fair use isn't common sense because they had to go through years of painful litigation. So guess what? It's not common sense. It's not common. And most people spouting common sense don't actually have any. Like most people using the common sense argument don't actually have any. Most people are ignorant of the rules, they're ignorant of the systems, they're ignorant of the laws. 99% of you even watching this have no idea how YouTube ads work. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna entertain those notions. So if you guys wanna get to the nitty gritty, um, you know, we're gonna talk about that. Now, um, I also want to go ahead and, um, you know, bring up something really cool that's gonna help a lot of you creators that has nothing to do with copyright but can help you if you're being demonetized as well as help you grow and promote your channel and make more money. And that is today's sponsor, which is TubeBuddy. 
TubeBuddy is an awesome platform that has helped me stop wasting time and has helped me focus on making my content and making more money. Uh, TubeBuddy is sponsoring today's live stream. They are a friend of the channel. They are also sponsoring my meetup on June 20, is it June 21st? Yes, it is. It's my birthday. June 21st at VidCon. If you're going to be at VidCon, TubeBuddy is sponsoring my meetup. Will you be able to meet me, uh, ask questions, take selfies, all of those things? Um, I might hook a couple of people up with some merch or even some, um, you know, printed out coupons for any of my products on Awesome Creator Academy. But TubeBuddy is awesome. TubeBuddy has really helped me with my channel a lot. Mostly the productivity side. They also have this great new feature if you're being demonetized where you can actually scan and find all your videos that have been demonetized and then bulk submit a manual review so that you can start making money on those videos again. So that's actually really cool. So definitely check out TubeBuddy. We have a link in the description for you. Also use my discount code, Roberto's Buddy, and you'll get 20% off of whatever plan you pick. Uh, this is my secret weapon. It's helped me grow my YouTube channel for years, has helped me manage my time more effectively, and I, you know, it's honestly, it's like the best tool in my arsenal. It's one of my favorite tools, but I think it's definitely number one, um, besides editing in Adobe Premiere. Um, so, guys, make sure you're checking out TubeBuddy.com slash awesome. Use the discount code Roberto's Buddy and get 20% off. With my sponsors, I'm trying to do everything I can to get you discounts and deals. I'm trying to work out some uh, things in terms of uh, potential giveaways. So make sure you guys are showing the sponsors some love. Uh, thanks, guys, for helping out on the live stream. Shout out to the TubeBuddy fan. Shout out to Phil. Shout out to Andrew Can. Uh, love you guys. And I'll see you at VidCon at my session on um, mastering your YouTube content strategy. All right, so let's move on. And we've got a couple of super chats here before we get into today's topic. Rewired Soul, my buddy, Chris Boutte, who's also a student in Awesome Creator Academy. Uh, the Rewired Soul says, almost every video I make with video clips citing sources is struck. I see movie and TV review channels do it all the time with no issue. What can I do? Well. Chris, this is also why, unfortunately, YouTube MCNs, multi-channel networks, for some people are a necessary evil. A lot of TV and movie reviewers actually, um, through their multi-channel networks, have uh, some appropriate licensing that's a cover for them, so they're whitelisted. So that usually helps them out quite a bit. Um, uploading your videos as unlisted or private first before you release them and planning to upload them early and then release them the next day or on a schedule can actually help because it gives you a chance to appeal something so uh, and get a manual review so I like that for people in your situation it can help um, fair use is difficult and tricky for these reasons a lot of people forget that from 2007 through 2013 Viacom Viacom like you know had a lawsuit with youtube and google it was a billion dollar lawsuit billion and they had just acquired youtube from uh its owners for like a billion dollars and so basically it was like oh take a complete loss on that and um that's why when people try to say that fair use is simple i call bs i call bs you know because if it was that simple, Viacom wouldn't have had a billion dollar lawsuit that almost killed YouTube in its infancy, okay? YouTube was almost killed in its infancy not less than five months after it was acquired by Google. And everyone likes to cry about like, oh, Google acquiring YouTube destroyed it. It saved it because you had all these people uploading TV shows and, and movies and things like that and YouTube was almost shut down. So it's complicated, but Chris, I hope this answers your question is what I would do in your situation is upload as private a day or two before if you can, so get ahead on your content schedule. I would also suggest that maybe, and MCN deals kind of suck for small YouTubers, but the reason some people still use them is that MCNs come sometimes are a copyright shield because they have the right relationships and agreements and they can help you protect your videos and protect your money sometimes, so it's a buffer. And so I think that that's important. Manny Ortiz, thank you for the $20, $19.99, $20 super chat. Manny Ortiz is one of the best photographers on YouTube. Guys, make sure you're checking him out. Um, he says, show Roberto some love, y'all. He has helped me so much with content and advice. Thanks, Manny. I appreciate you. 
Richard Danell, hope I'm pronouncing your um, name right. Happy early birthday, Roberto. Have a coffee, tea, insert favorite beverage here. Thank you. Five bucks Canadian. I will definitely throw that into the snack money. Appreciate that. Guys, hashtag feed Roberto. Um, <laughs> so, um, definitely appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, sometimes multi channel networks can definitely help. I want to read something to you guys here to kind of put a little bit of the copyright stuff into context. I want to read you guys some of the information from the actual Viacom YouTube lawsuit. And I'm using this kind of as a framing exercise to help you guys understand why this is a big deal and why I say it's not so simple. Um, and, and it's really not, it's complicated. So Viacom International versus YouTube Inc. Uh, number seven, Civic, uh, I'm not going to read all of that, uh, in the district court of uh, the Southern District Court of New York case in which Viacom sued YouTube, a video sharing site owned by Google, alleging YouTube had engaged in brazen and massive copyright infringement, allowing users to upload and view hundreds of thousands of videos owned by Viacom without permission. A motion for summary judgment seeking dismissal was filed by Google and granted in 2010 in the grounds of the Digital Millennia Copyright Act safe harbor provision. Google, uh, shielded Google from Viacom's copyright infringement claims in 2012 on appeal to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second um, Circuit. It was overturned, and on April 18, 2013, District Judge Stanton again granted summary judgment in favor of the defendant, YouTube, and an appeal was begun, but the parties settled in March of 2014. So, seven years. In context, YouTube was founded in February of 20, uh, 2005, 2005. YouTube was founded in 2005. It's 13 years old. It's got pimples. It's probably dating by now, okay? That's how young YouTube is. So get that right. Google acquired YouTube in November of 2006. So whenever anybody cries about the good old days and that Google ruined YouTube, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're full of crap because they didn't get their hooks into YouTube until like it, it was like about a year and six months old. So how long were you actually on YouTube? Were you really on YouTube in 2005, February? No. Okay. So it was only 16 months before Google got their hooks into it. And then within five months of that, Viacom sues for a billion dollars. You think you'd have a YouTube if Google didn't acquire it? All right. So let's, let's get that right. Background, March 13th, 2007. Viacom filed a $1 billion USD lawsuit against Google and YouTube alleging the site had engaged in brazen copyright infringement by allowing users to upload and view copyright material owned by Viacom. So when YouTube does stuff, when Google does stuff, and the creator community cries about it, and again, I love creators. You know, I respect creators, I'm a creator. A lot of my best friends are creators, but I want people to put this into context because context matters. Get with the facts. The reality is that the user base of YouTube is what causes the problems. When people put up slanderous, defamatory content that creates lawsuits that the mainstream media then puts up as headlines, that creates problems. When YouTubers decide to film dead bodies in the suicide forest of Japan, Logan, and it becomes a headline, that creates problems. Problems that cost money, problems that cost jobs. So guess what? When Google and YouTube and their lawyers do something, it's because some idiot jerkwad somewhere did something stupid that the other 99% of us end up paying for. At least we don't pay for it out of pocket with our wallets because Google and YouTube pony up the cash and they deal with it. And they deal with it to the best of their abilities. All the changes you're seeing to YouTube is because it was the wild, wild west, people couldn't behave themselves, and so the Mounties are here now, and we can all cry about the fact that the Mounties have showed up. But it was necessary because somebody decided to do something stupid. Alright? 
And when people do stupid things, there are usually billions of dollars on the line or millions of dollars on the line, and somebody's got to pay the piper, right? Because, you know, it's one of the downsides, but I love capitalism, but this is what happens. That being said, the litigation on this alone was more money than YouTube was bringing in because you have to remember, the YouTube ad revenue wasn't brought in until 2013, which is after this litigation was settled. So after this litigation was settled is when they opened the YouTube partner program to everybody, to you and to me, and then YouTube started making real money. You have to think about it, though. YouTube and Google were operating at a loss, at a net loss, the entire time. The entire time they were operating at a net loss, and this expensive lawsuit was part of that. Okay, so when you yell at YouTube and they've got problems, I've ranted and railed about it. You got to understand some background here. This is what happened just because people were uploading content they didn't have a right to use the entire time. And YouTube only settled that litigation completely four to five years ago. You know, it, it, it's, pro it's a problem. You know, I'm going to use it in the proper context. I'm going to use a word a lot of you don't like. This was problematic financially. You know, so they got it all settled and hashed out in 2013. Awesome. Now, let's pivot for a minute. I said all that to say this copyright isn't simple. Most people who use YouTube don't know how any system works in YouTube works. They don't know how Content ID works. They don't know how the ad revenue and the bidding system in Google AdWords works. They barely know how the functions of YouTube work. They barely know how you know, ranking and SEO and those things work. So I don't expect most people to understand copyright. I don't expect most people to understand fair use. However, before people complain and before people scream about the doom of it and the end of YouTube or this is gonna kill YouTube, I'd like them to do some research. I'd like them to look up some lawsuits in Wikipedia. I'd like them to get some facts right. I'd like them to go to copyright.gov. I'd like them to understand what they're talking about in an intelligent way instead of just having opinion. You got free speech, you're entitled to your opinion. You're also entitled to be called out with facts and evidence and data and legalese and told that you're full of crap. And that's just real. You're also entitled to educate yourself as much as possible to protect yourself and to protect your money and to protect your content so that it can be handled properly and so that your ad revenue is protected, so that your rights as a content creator are connected. I don't want someone stealing your content, going viral and making money that you deserve to make. That would be horrible. You know how upset I'd be if I, someone stole my content, got a viral video with 3 million views, and I didn't make a dime? That would bother me. I'm sure it would bother the far majority of you. Would that bother you if you worked hard on a video for like two weeks and someone stole your video, re-uploaded it, and made money on it, and you find out later after they've already cashed in and made that But Wouldn't you be upset about that? Don't you feel like you should be protected from that? Like, I want you protected as a content creator. Now, I also don't want somebody falsely striking your, your content if it's properly fair use. But here's another problem. There are people who do commentary sometimes that don't get their facts right, and it's not enough for them to do a video apology or retraction if it damages someone's business. If you talk about a content creator who does YouTube as a living that might be an incorporated entity, an LLC, or an S corporation, or is a brand ambassador and you do content and you get the facts wrong, they could sue you for damages. I'd much rather they just flag your video and take down your video or copy strike your video than come after you for damages that you're going to be sued into oblivion for. So understand that sometimes that copyright strike system is a deterrent or is a stopgap before escalating to a lawsuit. And the last thing we really need is more YouTube lawsuits for the mainstream media to salivate over. Just being very real with you there. 18 Willis, how are you? $10 super chat. Thanks, buddy. I just started following you about a month ago. You're pretty knowledgeable about what's going on with YouTube and how to make YouTuber channels better. Thanks for the information. No problem, dude. Appreciate it. Thank you for the uh, birthday donuts. Um, got you. That's a donut attack. You know, I, I might have to slow down on those donuts. It's like, you know, 
Um, diabetes is one of the leading causes of um, health problems in America today. Uh, don't need that. Um, that was a cool trick, Axe. That's why you can't use copyright music. Um, yes, copyright music, the music industry is very ruthless about enforcing copyright and enforcing digital rights management. Um, it's a huge problem. And so um, this, this becomes a reason you can't use copyright music. However, the good news is that there are a lot of content creators like No Copyright Sounds and Majestic Casual that have made uh, royalty-free music for you guys available usually for free as long as you attributed and give them some love on their channel uh, you can use that stuff for free YouTube has expanded its music library that's important in fact actually I want to hook you guys up with something uh, pretty cool how would you guys like to um, get a 30-day free trial of epidemic sound so that if you want to do music stuff on YouTube you can definitely do that and you can um, use a library so which by the way if you guys have been wondering about the music that i've been using lately in uh my videos it's been um through epidemic sound and you can get a um 30-day free trial and by the way that is an affiliate link for me so it does super help me out when you use it but um epidemic sound 30 days free i'm going to drop that link for you guys i'm going to make a better short link for this um eventually um but there you go and that's also linked in the description of this video so sign up that helps me out but you guys also can download a bunch of royalty free music some of the best stuff curated and you get it for 30 days free and if you like it just keep paying monthly on it and it's pretty dope um nick nimmin in the house how are you my friend appreciate you yeah epidemic sound is awesome yep absolutely so there's a lot of myths that you can use copyright music for seven seconds. Here's what I'll tell you about copyright music. There's a lot of myths around that and it doesn't really work. Some people do it and some people are just big enough to where it's like, oh, if I lose the monetization on this video, no big deal or whatever. They don't care and they do it just to be cool. Um, but here's the thing. There's really no reason to use copyrighted music in your YouTube videos. There are, There's no reason. Let me ask you guys an honest question. Why do you think you need to use copyrighted music in a YouTube video. Why do you think that's going to help a YouTube video? Because you know what helps a YouTube video? Increasing your click-through rate, which is all about your title and thumbnail. Ranking helps, which is about your SEO, using things like TubeBuddy. And then actually being good on camera, having good energy on camera, and keeping people engaged. That keeps people watching to get you a 50% or higher retention rate. If you have seven seconds of a popular song in your channel, it's not gonna really help your retention rate, is it? So how does that get you a 50% retention rate? So there's really no reason to have a copyrighted music in your YouTube video, right? At the end of the day, there's no reason. The exception is if it's parody. Now if it's parody, that's a completely different fair use thing, and I would recommend doing a little bit of extra work to remix it, but that's parody and that should be transformative enough to be protected under fair use but if you're doing that parody it should probably be a play to get attention and mainstream awareness and you shouldn't worry about the money you will probably get a copyright claim and not make any money but you probably won't get a copyright strike so you know for that uh, it makes sense fire desire entertainment says we use popular music for our dance music our dance shows and that is my content. Sometimes we find cool non-copyright music, but most of my performances that we film and put up is copyright music. So Fire Desire Entertainment, you would actually be really good to use something like Epidemic Sounds because they've got royalty-free, copyright-free uh, remixes of music that might be popular that you could use, and that would be helpful to you. And then also their are remixes in SoundCloud that might be able to work if they're allowing that stuff to be used with um, attribution? Oh, the um, the link for Epidemic Sound is taking you to ConvertKit, you're saying? All right, I'll get you the Epidemic Sound link. Um, that's my bad. Um, like, So that's my bad. I guess I just confused my links real quick, but I'll take care of you. So 
this is the epidemic sounds link epidemic epidemic sounds I know I probably didn't spell that right but you get the idea here you go and I will fix that in the description for you guys right now fix it right now uh, boom so that's updated in the description of the live stream so that takes care of you guys and later I'll make some kind of clever short link through my website for it to make things easier but yeah epidemic sounds um, is gonna be whitelisted so you won't have to worry about you know copyright strikes on that or copyright claims and losing the money I'm gonna explain the difference between a copyright claim and a copyright strike for you guys in a minute um, yes you need to use um, YouTube approved music for the most part yeah there are myths about getting away with like seven seconds five seconds some people do if you're okay with taking the risk here's the thing I'm gonna tell you if you absolutely feel you want to use copyright music you need to be 110 percent okay with making zero ad money on that video if you are okay with you making zero dollars in ad money on that video do it then you can do it um, you know sweep the leg go for it but if you want to make money on that video then don't use copyright music if you want to make money on a video don't use copyright music if you are okay with just getting the views and the subs by doing something dope and using copyright music have at it hoss that's what I'll say about it um, but yeah um, you know um, remix uh, remixes can help um, rewired soul thank you for the five dollar super chat buddy thanks another uh, feed Roberto hashtag feed Roberto the awesome creator Academy is the main reason I've grown 10x since the start of the year and are now getting sponsors yeah it's it's been working out great for you man uh, you've been crushing it um, you know and I'd like I'd like you're on the way you might get 10,000 before the end of the year at this point uh, Chris rewired soul so um, I think you're gonna make it I think you're gonna make 10k and for a mental health YouTube channel that's a big deal that is definitely a big deal um let's see I think if you use uh, epidemic sounds for 30 days you'll want to keep paying for it um, kind of like anything if you don't pay for it maybe you don't get to use it um yeah that's kind of how capitalism works um you know but if you want free stuff okay YouTube has a free sound library that everyone has access to no copyright sounds majestic casual granted you'll have the same music as everyone else I think that a long-term investment in your channel makes total sense and I think that throwing a little bit of money at it every now and again if you want to grow it makes sense now if you're not making any money on your channel and you don't have money to spare then do everything for free but understand that you're at a disadvantage and that's just reality you know that's just reality um, everybody's at um, you know a disadvantage versus somebody possibly that has more resources or more time or more talent you know or is smarter like you know everybody's got their cross to bear everybody's got something to complain about I guess um Somebody's saying the audio is a little loud. Um, well, let me try adjusting the gain a little bit and seeing if. Um, and also, I'm loud. I'm just loud right now. Let me see if I can adjust it a little bit. All right, so maybe now. Um, hang on. All right, so let's try that. Okay, so maybe this isn't um, loud or clipping or whatever for you guys if you're saying I'm being loud. Um, So yeah, base attack says Roberto. How'd you grow so much if you started um, so much if you started small? Did people believe that you were what you were saying when you were small, or were you making different videos? Dude, I like. Here's the thing: a lot of you who watch, a lot of you who watch these YouTube uh, Q and A videos, or you watch the YouTube Friday related content, you think that I'm a YouTube tips channel. My friend Nick Nimmin's a YouTube tips channel. My friend Tim Schmoyer is. Uh, a YouTube tip channel Brian G Johnson Daryl Eves uh, those guys are friends of mine and their YouTube tip channels I'm not a YouTube tip channels 
I talk about YouTube because it's the best platform for building your personal brand. It's the strongest video marketing platform. It is the second largest search engine in the world. I talk about YouTube because I'm a businessman and I'm a marketer and I'm a creative entrepreneur. YouTube is one of the most powerful outlets for creative people right now. That's the only reason I care about YouTube is that it's an outlet for creative people to showcase their talent, have a voice. It is a platform for people to come here, be entrepreneurs in a different way, make money, be successful. It is a powerful platform for marketing yourself regardless of where you come from in the world and you can you could possibly make it. Like That's the only reason I really care about YouTube, guys. I don't care about being a YouTuber in the way that other people care about a silver play button or maybe being an authority talking about YouTube advice in that way. That doesn't mean the same thing to me as it probably means to some of you and there's no disrespect I'm just a different kind of dude right like 85% of my content on this channel doesn't have jack to do with YouTube it has everything to do with taking your talent taking your skills using the technology of your time hustling and making a life for yourself whether that means getting the job that you want getting the career that you want building a business being an entrepreneur or being a talented creative person in the world and getting your stuff in front of people that's all i care about that's all i want you know so people didn't have to believe what i was saying about youtube when i was small because i wasn't talking about youtube when i was small i didn't have the audacity to say jack about growing a youtube channel until i had like 20,000 subscribers because people in my community who wanted to do it asked me you guys asked me like how do i do what you're doing roberto the same way you asked me roberto how do i learn um, Adobe Premiere. Okay, Roberto, how do I learn graphic design? Roberto, how do I start an online business? Roberto, how do I make money as a freelancer? I'm answering your questions about how to be successful. A lot of you just happen to have questions about YouTube and I happen to know a lot about it, but it's like, I didn't grow my channel talking about YouTube tips. I didn't grow my channel talking about YouTube tips. I grew my channel, like I grew like 50,000 of the people who came to this channel came to this channel because I talked about freelancing and graphic design. 20,000 of the people that came to this channel came from three videos that I did about three videos about how to make money online and how to make passive income. Three videos, 20,000 of the people on this channel. Okay? This channel did not grow because I started talking about YouTube. My speaking career did. Absolutely. My consulting business did. Absolutely. My coaching business did. Absolutely. You know. So, I mean, I mean, I, it sounds probably a little condescending or snarky to say it that way, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you the truth. I ain't got nothing to hide there. You know? Um, so, growing is about building off of, for me, it was about building off of experiences that you have. I don't talk about things I don't know and don't understand, and when I do, I'm showing you the process and the journey of starting something from zero so that you understand that you shouldn't be intimidated by it, you know? Um, you know, but anyway, we got a super chat, so I've got to answer a question. I mean, Tune Colors, if you want to go ahead and leave, that's fine. Come back and watch the replay, but you're going to miss the information. I mean, if you've been watching from the beginning, you learned a few things about copyright, but, you know, whatever. Like, people want to go, oh, too long, didn't read. Like, fine. Um, yes, TubeBuddy helped me a lot. Um, six plus, 60 plus fit, how are you? Holding it down, nice. Um, mad props, I'll keep posting. I know you want to get better. It's you and Sean Canal who I'm learning how to do this. Absolutely. Yeah, Sean Canal is another buddy of mine, but he's not a YouTube tips channel either. He's helping you learn how to uh, make income, influence, and impact with online video, with the tools. and like I'm closer to my friend Sean Canal probably in my content than my other homies. So, you know, um, you know, that that's the thing. Um... Let's see. Copyright, copyright, copyright. There's something I want to show you guys um, that's coming. And here's an article. I'm going to bring up an article over on TubeFilter, and I'm going to read some of this to you because it'll help you understand why I'm making this video because content ID is important, and it's an important system, and most of you don't know about the content ID system. For those of you who don't know, the content ID system is a copyright tool that music studios, 
uh, film companies, television companies like Viacom, a few agencies have access to. Um, I didn't get access to it, and my agency should have got access to it, but whatever, uh, for the other business that I run. But you, the YouTube Content ID tool uh, helps people, um, not individual creators, but it's how companies, when they see, oh, you used our film or you used this, they match it. Um, and I did, uh, one of my YouTube certifications is in content um, ownership, which is about this system. And so basically there are systems in place that if you use a certain amount of copyrighted material, it matches it and then a policy enacts. And the policy as dictated by the copyright holder can either claim part of the ad revenue of that video, all of the ad revenue of that video, or it can request to have that video taken down. That is all at the discretion of the copyright holder if a copyright match occurs and primarily audio is used to facilitate a content ID match. There's also parameters where it can be set to say if they use more than this amount of the content, more than this amount of the content, more than this amount of the content, and that's at the discretion of the copyright holder. Some of them are very generous and liberal about how much of your content that you, they, they, you can use before a content match and then policy is enacted. Some are much less liberal on that and are much more stringent, much more conservative in how much you can use or any at all, and there might be a zero tolerance policy there. So it all depends on the copyright holder. Nintendo is super ruthless about this. Some other companies are. Viacom, I think, is coming around. They bought VidCon. I think they're coming around to a different way of thinking. I think a younger regime is taking over in Viacom than the people who sued or tried to sue YouTube and Google into oblivion back in 2007 through 2014. So... But you can thank that for why we have a copyright and content ID system. And to be honest with you, some of it is necessary because some of it is exploited. As a creator, if I was a filmmaker or a musician, I wouldn't want people stealing my stuff and me getting no money. That's real. As a content creator now, as someone who does online courses and podcasts, I don't want people making money off of stealing from me. Like, I'm sure you guys don't want people stealing from you too. I know that people, it's a sensitive subject and people are like, oh, everything should be fair use. And But no, no, this is, this is a, like, some of you are international, but like, I'm an American, okay? I'm a first generation American on my father's side. I'm a capitalist, I'm a small business owner. I believe in capitalism. Everything isn't fair use. It has to meet a standard to be fair use. You don't get to make money on the back of somebody else's work like that if you're not doing everything the right way, the way H3H3 does it, the way Philip DeFranco does it, like the, um, the way that, um, anime girl does it the way that geekdom 101 does it like you have to actually adhere to some real standards for fair use and if you don't i ain't got no sympathy for you okay because i don't believe you stealing or making money on the back of an artist just because oh i i, I saw it on the internet i guess i can use it it's like i don't got i don't have any sympathy for you making money on the back of a filmmaker a musician a photographer a youtuber on the content that they made because you barely did any work to transform it or to do proper commentary or to do education on it or to do journalistic integrity or whatever. Like, I ain't got no sympathy for that. I ain't entertaining that nonsense. I'm a capitalist. I want creators to make money. I want the people who actually make stuff in this world to make money. I don't want people stealing from them. Do we need reforms? Yes. Do we need to have an honest conversation about it? Yes. Do creators need to be more involved in the policy creation? 110%. You want to get with me on the front lines of those battles? Hats off to you. Yes. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Whining and saying YouTube copyright sucks or oh blah 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 or that they should eliminate this or eliminate that? Screw you. I'm being blunt and not everyone's going to like that. Not everyone's a fan. I got it. Got it. Like, but again, I'm for the creator that put in 20 hours of work to do their thing and to make something, not for the person who decided to, like, you know, try to profit off of their hard work per se. I'm for that, you know, independent filmmaker who went out of their way to secure funding, not for the person who decided to rip off their thing, you know? I'm for that dude sweating or that girl sweating in the studio, cranking out track after track after track, not the person just trying to rip it off and give it away for free to everybody 
and no one buys their album, okay? So, I mean, I just had to rant about that because, like, that's real to me. That's friends of mine that you're taking money out of the pockets of, you know? Those are my friends that you're taking money out of the pockets of, so I'm, like, you know, I'm mad about it. Um, anyway, YouTube is bringing an abbreviated version of its content ID copyright tool to the masses. This I'm slightly worried about being subject to abuse, but let's read on. YouTube is beta testing a new feature called Copyright Match that would bring an abbreviated version of its content ID tool to the masses. A sneak peek video on its Creator Insider channel. By the way, if you guys are not subscribed to Creator Insider, I highly recommend that you subscribe to Creator Insider. It's a really good channel. Um, YouTube product manager Barbara McDonald explained that the Copyright Match will help creators to crack down on other channels who frustratingly re-upload their works. You know, this is happening to a lot of animators on YouTube. It's screwing over the animators on YouTube. Um, copyright Match will let you identify who re-uploaders are and let you take some actions, she explains, including doing nothing, contacting the offending channel. That's, that's dope. We definitely need that. Or asking YouTube to delete the video in question. That seems a little like that'll be abused, but we need it for the other reasons, you know, two-way street. While Copyright Match works like Content ID in that it scans a database of reference files for prospective duplicates, the Content ID tool offers more sophisticated and robust options than the Copyright Match does, including the ability for rights holders to monetize infringing videos to track their analytics. So basically what they're saying is that we will be able to, as content creators, find people who ripped off our content and either have a conversation with them and get them to fix things or tell YouTube to delete that video. What we won't get to necessarily do is claim the money. Now, people who are in multi-channel networks or work with digital rights management companies have the capacity to do that and to claim that money. This became a controversy recently when a small um, creator, or was it a Twitch streamer or something? It was a Twitch streamer, and I, I can't speak to how popular she was or wasn't because I'm not familiar really with her content. I'm familiar with the situation partly because Philip DeFranco and a few commentators and PewDiePie himself um, talked about it, but my stance was everyone was too upset about the YouTube drama situation, and no one was thinking about the copyright situation and the systems and nothing is going to get done because that's why nobody knows about this that's why no attention is being given to this that's why i'm making today's video is copyright content id copyright strikes copyright matching copyright claims these are important topics most youtubers are ignorant to them most streamers are ignorant to them most social media people are ignorant to them but it really 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 matters and it's going to get more complicated and there's a lot of money on the line but everyone would rather talk about the YouTube drama aspects of these things when uh, either a small creator strikes a big creator or claims a creator's video or a big creator claims or strikes a small creator's video or something like that or oh I don't think I think that what I did was fair use or oh I think that like I should be able to talk about this person or whatever like and there's things even with libel and slander there but you know the big deal here is that there's a system of tools that may or may not be abused by either content creators or by companies that might buy the rights to content that otherwise was not going to be claimed. And uh, this happened and hurt my friend Dash. Mitch, who runs the Dash Star Wars YouTube channel, he got crushed by something like this because a media company I'm not going to name names. I'm not familiar with which media company acquired the rights in this thing. But a media company bought a bunch of assets that were up for auction. And they ended up acquiring the rights to a very, very old Star Wars game for PC. And they got the music track rights for that. And the thing is, this thing was like over 12 years old. And they used that to claim the money and copyright for most of Mitch's inventory of his older videos because he had like five seconds of music from an old Star Wars game and so he lost the the money on most of his old content. It was devastating. His channel still hasn't fully recovered from this. And these systems are going to be abused more and more 
if we don't have conversations about it and if we don't talk to media companies and media rights companies and if every time YouTube copyright comes out we focus on YouTube drama instead of on the legal system around copyright and also around legislation to have copyright and fair use and technology kind of like like the law catch up to the technology and to the way we use it it's going to be problematic because otherwise you're going to have geriatric people in government making rules for things they don't understand and they will never use and that they'll never have to live with the consequences of and all of us will have to deal with it and that's happening right now and no one's saying anything and no one's doing anything about it because they'd rather be entertained and that's the problem with YouTube as a community sometimes, is that we don't get on the front lines of real issues like this and net neutrality in a substantive way. And it's frustrating for someone like me to just watch it happen. And it creams friends of mine all the time. And it's a problem. So while copyright match works like content ID, we talked about that, um, including the ability for rights holders to monetize infringing videos. Okay, so we won't get to... Uh, claim the money. Now, if you're with a multi-channel network, you might be able to do that through the existing system. That's real. Mostly right now, you can issue strikes for community guidelines or get stuff taken down. If someone is doing libel or slanderous content, aka saying things that aren't true about you or your business or your company, uh, you can strike that. I'd rather you strike them and take their video down than sue them. Lawsuits are pricey. The YouTube community gets into headlines when people do lawsuits but if you need to protect your business by all means take the proper legal actions consult your lawyer that's just kind of my view on it but if people are going to talk trash in the internet they should you know understand that there might be consequences um additionally while copyright match is only able to catch identical video for video reuploads content id is more sophisticated in that it can detect audio or video infringement that occurs within a short segment of a clip this is why you take a risk with five to seven seconds if you do music content or if you do a tv show this is a problem but i also am concerned that this whole thing could end up being subject to abuse with regard to commentary channels and news channels could be unfairly uh, hit with this. I think that um, almost every YouTube commentator should be worried about this and what this means. And I think it's going to mean that reaching out to people when you're doing a piece, you're going to have to do it similar to the way that um, journalists in the media do it, I, I think, until we get more information. That's like going to be the thing. Now, if you're not doing TV or television re reviews or news or YouTube commentary, this might not affect you, at least for now, based on everything we're understanding. But this is important. Now, uh, McDonald said that the copyright match may roll out to more creators beyond the initial pilot test in the coming weeks. I'm going to reach out and try to get into this pilot test so that I can understand this better. Um, I'm also going to reapply for Content ID as an agency. Content ID, on the other hand, is only available to select applicants who must own exclusive rights to a substantial body of original material that is frequently uploaded by the YouTube user community. I mean, I've done a thousand videos. I think I qualify. Um, according to the company's help pages, you can check out the application to receive Content ID access and you can read more about how to qualify here. YouTube itself did not respond to request for comment. Here's something interesting. Here's an interesting quote. We understand the frustrations that creators feel when their intellectual property is used without proper license because we've been providing content ID and manual claim services since 2013. Notice that date, 2013. Remember when I talked about Viacom? And when I talked about that district court ruling in 2013 of April 18th, Content ID and the YouTube Partner Program rolled out in 2013. It's not a coincidence. YouTube has been providing Content ID and manual claim services since 2013. Think about that. This is why I keep talking about the timeline of YouTube's development as a platform and why I keep saying that creators don't understand the platform. Susan Quang, COO of Digital Talent Network and Rights Management Provider Collab, 
You guys might be familiar with Collab. Collab was at the center of the controversy between PewDiePie, the biggest YouTuber, and the streamer Alinity recently. But Collab, as PewDiePie and both Philip DeFranco called out, which they talked about more than they talked about the drama with Alinity, thank God, because it, this is the important thing. Um, Collab DRM can be abused as a system. What they're doing in theory, by the way, with digital rights management, if used properly and if and when it works, is a good thing for a creator. If it's abused as it was in the case that Philip DeFranco, PewDiePie, and everybody's been talking about, if it's abused, it's bad. But that's like any tool, any system, any resource, it can be weaponized. It can be weaponized. The Joker showed us that you can weaponize a pencil. <laughs> you know, in the Dark Knight Rises. It's like, oh, I made the pencil disappear, right? Like, anything can be weaponized, right? So, I'm not giving Collab a pass. I'm just pointing out that, connect the dots here. We've got a content matching system coming to creators that has been usually reserved for media agencies, and creators already don't understand copyright. This could be subject to abuse. Collab DRM is com com uh, commenting on this, and they're a digital rights management company. There is fault to go around, but the thing is, intent matters, context matters, and digital rights management, if you are, like, let's say you're a Snapchatter, and you're not even really popular on YouTube, but a YouTuber takes all your Snapchatter Instagram stories, does a, 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 a compilation of all your stuff, and is making money on it, you're screwed. You should have a way to deal with that. So a service allowing for that is a good thing for you as somebody that's an Instagrammer, a Snapchatter, if Vine comes back, a Viner, uh, a streamer on Facebook, Twitch, whatever. So the intent here is good and it's a good business and it's smart. The abuses are about fine tuning and about reforms and also about community education because the biggest problem in YouTube is how uneducated the community is about a variety of the issues, tools, and remedies available to them. And that's always been a problem. That's why channels like me and Daryl Eves and Tim Schmoyer and Brian G. Johnson and Sonny Laraduzzi and Sean Canal, it's why we're around is because education's important. Education's important. It's also a lucrative business, but it's important. Um, and it will become more important as it becomes more complicated because this stuff isn't simple. It's not. Anyone saying that, again, copyright or fair use is simple or it's common sense, it's not. Because if it wasn't complicated, there wouldn't be so much money on the line. The copyright tool is a step in the right direction, but it would be interesting to see how this tool resolves disputes because there's, no, there's so much misinformation in the community regarding fair use. Not giving Collab a pass, but I agree with Song Kang. I'm hoping I pronounced that name right. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with Song Kang on this because it is complicated and there is so much misinformation and myths out there and people are using what somebody might have gotten away with as a bad example. So it's bad science. Kang added that if a creator notices that copyright match happens to be catching numerous re-uploads, it may be worth contacting a digital rights management service to pursue non-monetization of the infringements. Well, of course Kang would say that because that's the service his company provides. Not going to hate the player, you know, res you know, respect, you know, but uh, yeah, you know, market your business in this article, like good on you, like capitalism. Um... But yeah, so now I hope you guys understand a little bit better. You guys are saying audio levels are peaking. Um, I tried adjusting it, um, but I'm just loud too. So there's that. I'm loud. Um, this should be better though. So maybe it's that. Or again, maybe it's just I'm loud. I'm super loud. Um, the mic isn't even right in front of me. I'm just super loud, I guess. Um... So let's go to some of your comments and let's answer some of these super chats. Let's let's keep the conversation going. Uh, this is super important. Front page tech, my boy John Prosser, um, Roberto, my boy, love you, keep killing it. Thank you, John. Appreciate you, John. In the house. Um, yeah, I agree. Great content from them. Um, Less, thank you, Less, uh, El Blatino, um, who's also in Awesome Creator Academy. 
Uh, it's not a prob bad problem to have to be creative and make your own stuff. My feelings on copyrights. Um, yeah, yeah, be creative and do your own stuff. That's um, that's important. Absolutely. Angelina says, I think companies that blatantly ignore fair use should be subject to community guideline strikes. Um, companies can't necessarily be subject to community guideline strikes because there's nothing to strike if it's a company. You get what I'm saying? They're not content creators. They're companies. Uh, Self-publishing with Dale. How are you, buddy? 100% agree about Creator Insider. They shared a video. Uh, I shared a video there. Subscribe quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Painful and Tech. Anyone who thinks they can use someone else's art for free is not an artist. Try making a living from art. From, ev from, from art, everyone thinks is free. I agree with you, Jason. I agree. Um, let's see. Hot mic. Uh, it's a little distorted. Sorry about that. Not sure how I feel about YouTube um, allowing it to the masses. Uh, I have some, I have some concerns and reservation about YouTube rolling out a tool like this to the masses. Um, YouTubers always say they want more tools, they want more uh, things, and but I, again, I'm not, I'm not sure that most people have the ability to. Um, I, I, I don't think they have the ability to properly sometimes comprehend what it is that the tools do. I, I, I don't think that a lot of them understand. You know, that, that bothers me that there's just a lack of education. There's so much information out there that's just wrong. Um, Nightmare Gadget says, I don't have a problem with the new copyright rule. Awesome. Um, Geese74 says, no one likes the, their content being stolen. I totally get that, but the rules have gotten strict on gaming channels, covering songs, animators are having strikes. I think it needs to be uh, refined, okay? I definitely think it needs to be refined, and I don't want innocent creators that are acting in good faith to uh, get hit. But I do think that we have some problems with people not understanding, on both sides, by the way, both creators not understanding, but also our geriatric, you know, bodies and government. People are way too old and don't understand the technology. And it's not to be ageist, but a little bit personally, like in my opinion, I'm a little ageist, just a little bit when it comes to government, when it comes to technology. Technology is the foundation of our society right now, not manual labor. Right now, it's technology. The U.S. is leading and crushing it because we have all the social media platforms. We have some of the best technology companies. We've got everything. Like... But if we don't have laws that scale to meet that technology, if we're the U.S., and for my international folks, I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about, like the U.S. can't be a leader if our laws don't respect the technology of our time and respect the entrepreneurs using the technology of our time. If you're on YouTube, you're not a YouTuber, you're a creative entrepreneur. Whether you want to be or not, whether you understand it or not, you're a social entrepreneur at bare minimum. And the laws around net neutrality, fair use, copyright, trademark, are a big deal for you. They are, you know? And you need to understand those things and you need to take them seriously. Now, if you're a hobby creator, God bless. Don't worry about it, you know? But it bothers me. It bothers me that there are people who barely know how to use email telling us what we can do with the internet. You know, I just have to be real about that and I have to be straightforward about it. I have to be blunt about it because it's the only thing I, I can do. Um... As for false flagging, that's a problem. False flagging is a problem. I definitely agree with Smoothie Lady that it's a problem. I don't know what YouTube is doing to deal with false flagging, uh, but I do know that they need to do something about it because you know it's not fair if people are acting in good faith, but I also think that false flagging happens unintentionally. I think it happens because people don't understand what their rights are. And the thing is, YouTube provides so much information about this, guys, but people don't bother. Too long, didn't read. Too long, didn't read. Oh, I don't want to watch a 10-minute video on it. Like, people are not educating themselves. They are willfully not educating it, 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 it themselves and, and it becomes a problem. Now, there is room and should be room for fair use for the good scenarios, because I'm, again, I'm talking about the, 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 the bad scenarios and sure, yes, but like, I love music parodies, right? I love music parodies, but I think it's a slippery slope because not everyone does it properly. And so it's hard to draw a line on what fair use is for a music parody. I love 
television show reviews. One of my favorite channels is Emergency Awesome. Charlie Snyder does some of the best content on YouTube in my opinion. He's earned his way to 2 million subscribers for a reason. I like what Forever World does. I like what Geekdom 101, my friend Daniel does. Um, I like what a smaller channel, Chibi Reviews, does, okay? Um, I love what Anime Girl does. I love what Mecha Frieza does, okay? These are channels that rely on fair use being upheld. And I think it should be protected for them. But I also think that they're examples of people who are using fair use properly and are educating themselves about it to the best of their ability and I think that more people need to do that. And I think that it would help with them doing truly transformative content. I love what H3H3 does. You know, and that's the example of really good fair use. Um, he's a controversial figure, but I would be lying if I didn't say I was entertained, if I wasn't entertained by iDubs, what Ian does. Um, and that's a, a very hard line example of fair use, but also of satire that doesn't cross the line of slander or libel so i like his approach to it and i think he's super smart because he does it like an expose like he's hardcore he takes months at a time to do this stuff he doesn't just get an idea and do it next week like so i think that fair use is a very difficult issue i think that there should be protections for it obviously but i think that most youtubers throw up the protection of it as an excuse for their own lack of of, of, of educating themselves about the law surrounding the thing they're doing. And it's a problem. Um, Mido Jed says, thank you for doing this recently hit 32 K subs. And I hope I will go full time on YouTube soon. Listen to this man, guys, his words, pure gold. Oh, thank you for that. I super appreciate you. Um, get good Millhouse. Do you think that I can grow a following through social media by documenting my journey to becoming a better artist and growing my skills? I'm an animator. Uh, I absolutely think you can. And I think that approaching it as documenting the journey, um, like Gary Vee would say, document versus create, I think that that's real. And I think you can grow a community around that because there are other people trying to do what you're trying to do. And I think documenting it definitely helps. Um, I think you need a good strategy for it. So yeah. Uh, Metalhead Militia says, rest in peace to the hardworking quote unquote reactor channels. I guess you mean reaction channels? Um, maybe, maybe, it, it depends. The copyright ID system already should be um, doing something theoretically there. So um, maybe. Geese74 says, I know of services called Louder, but with the way YouTube is always changing, it's possible to still get um, a strike. Uh, possibly. Um, louder and comparable services like Disco Kid, Sound Drop, etc. only work for audio, but yeah, their great syncing video is different. Um, so for podcasters or for people doing an audiobook, maybe they should use a digital rights service like Louder. I'm gonna look into that. Or Sound Drop, because I think if you're a podcaster and someone's re uploading your stuff, they're ripping you off. I think if you do an audiobook and someone's re-uploading your whole audiobook, they're ripping you off and there should be a way to deal with that. Absolutely. So if there's services that do that, 100%. Um, everyone asking why I use the live stream? I use Wirecast. I use Wirecast. Um, Sasha Deska, thank you for the $9.99. Happy early birthday, kiddo. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, CHF, $10 um, or rather it's Ray, Rayhena Itana, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hi from Switzerland, so it's in Switzerland currency, cool. As a paralegal for a multinational who works on copyrights, image rights daily, I'm especially interested by today's topic and your input. Oh, and the SC is uh, $10 USD equivalent. Okay, nice, awesome. Love Switzerland, you guys are great. We should adopt more things from you guys. Um. You might want to turn down the mic. Yeah, I think I did that. Mike is redlining. Yep, took care of that. King Tuts Pro. Awesome. Glad you're here. What did YouTube change exactly? Uh, YouTube is giving creators content match, which is similar to content ID, which means that creators will be able to reach out to people and match uh, for content and copyright stuff. Um, they'll be able to contact the person, but also they could get the video taken down a lot more easily than the current system. 
So YouTube is giving a mini version of the content ID system to creators. It's in beta right now. It's in beta, but this is a big deal. Uh, Ted Times, do you know when the sponsor feature will be rolled out to more people? Um, we don't know right now. Um, we don't know. It is partner exclusive, but it's also bigger channels uh, and gaming channels, but it, it'll come uh, eventually. Haunted Road Media says, as a publisher who deals with copyright, yeah, uploading someone else's audiobook is definitely ripping them off. Yep. Uh, Rin Reviews, have you seen that Storytime animations are blowing up lately? Uh, I feel they have for a while. I mean, Swoozy's been crushing it. Um, Big Deal Marketing says, hey, can you recap the issue with the new policy? I've gotten behind with YouTube changes. Um, I'll talk about it here in a second. Um... Boss Attacks, please stop asking the same question. Um, Daryl Eves made a video about affiliate marketing on channels. Please reference the video from Daryl Eves. Thanks. Um, all right, so I think I hit all the super chats. Um, I think I also hit some of your questions about this, you know, copyright thing. Um, CD Raymer says, I have a dedicated band of trolls that love to repost my content to Russian sites. Google Chrome will translate Russian and most websites will honor my DCMA takedowns. Oh, well that's important. Yeah, so I mean, Oh, we've had people literally ripping off uh, content in other languages too. Yeah, that's that's a real big deal. That's important. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think we're mostly in agreement that like your intellectual property as a content creator should be protected and more tools that help with that um, are in the community's best interest, but the problem is that those things can be subject to abuse. So a quick recap for people just coming in late or that, you know, went and took a snack. Um, like, let's go ahead and talk about these issues again real quick. Um, so there's an article here on Tube Filter, and I'm gonna link this in the description for you guys. Um, let me try and do that real quick, but essentially, YouTube is right now in beta for a tool that um, that definitely I think is super important um, around content matching. It's similar to their content ID. And um, I'm gonna put the articles referenced in this video. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in the description for you guys so that you can um, you know, look this stuff up later on your own. But essentially, they're bringing an abbreviated version of Content ID and the copyright tool to everybody. And this is gonna be part of the new YouTube Creator Studio. Um, and so you can see a sneak peek of this at the Creator Insider channel, but essentially, it's going to allow creators to match content if somebody re-upload their content and then they can either reach out to the person who re-uploaded their content or they can get the video taken down. Again, my concerns are this could definitely be abused. This could definitely be abused, but, but the current system is abused a little bit already, so we need refinements there. But this is a big change and this is a big deal. Um, and like, let's, let me change this title real quick to the new YouTube copyright tool to avoid some confusion for people because what this is going to do is there will be policy changes that result from this once this is out of beta. Like that's very that's that's inevitable. But this tool being in the hands of more people means that they're going to have to take false flags seriously and do something about that.
and it also means that more people might be interested in things like Collab DRM, which was the center of a big copyright controversy in the YouTube community recently around around PewDiePie. But he's familiar with this company, like, and it's not just Collab DRM. There are other companies, uh, media companies. Many of you might be familiar with that that claim creators' content over the littlest thing. So. Um, if they acquire the rights. Like I said, this happened to my friend Dash, who does Dash Star Wars. It's like, this happens to a lot of people, okay? And it's not talked about a lot. So this will affect the overall YouTube community once this is out of beta, because I could see initially within the first month, even channels that don't mean to I could see channels abusing this because they don't understand how what copyright really is and what fair use is. I also can see channels that should have been hit a long time ago finally being forced to take fair use seriously and raise their standard because they've just gotten away with stuff up until now. So this could go a lot of different ways, guys. I don't think it's the doom of fair use, but I think that both companies, creators, our, our, our government officials, I think that everyone needs to better understand how copyright and fair use has to operate moving forward. Um, so I think that this is just an important conversation. So, what I would say is, um, I'm trying to put this into a, a context for you because some people are saying that they can't understand. Here's what you need to understand. Crucify Robin Hood. I don't know what's so difficult about you understanding what I'm saying, and you know what? I've linked the article for reference, so you can definitely educate yourself about this. YouTube is re rolling out, and is in beta right now, a copyright tool for most, like once this goes out, and I'll just adjust the, the volume here again because it keeps changing, that's fine, whatever. Um, YouTube is rolling out a content copyright ID tool that has mostly been a problem for agencies and media companies that have used it and have claimed content on creator stuff, either claiming the money or taking down the video or striking the video, a version of this tool is gonna to be rolled out to all content creators eventually. It's in beta right now. And then this can be problematic because it's ripe and subject to abuse. It will force YouTube to really adjust the rules around false copyright strikes and false copyright claims and things of that nature. And so this is going to affect a lot of people and a lot of channels. Now, somebody's saying stop begging the government to get involved. They are criminals and sociopaths. Eh, the government is made up of people. Are some of those people criminals or sociopaths? Maybe. Possibly. Probably. I don't know. I'm not begging for the government to get involved. I'm saying that the government's already involved. Do you not understand how the court of appeals works? Do you not understand how copyright law works? Do you not understand how trademark law works? works. So if you're going to come at me with, oh, stop the, oh, the government, the big bad government's evil. The government is involved in every business owner's thing, and it's not going to stop. The government's involved in internet. That's not going to stop. What I would like is if they're going to be involved, if they're going to be involved, I'd like them to be educated. I'd like them to actually be young enough to use email properly. You know, that's a real thing. And I would like them to know what the heck they're talking about. I would like them to be people who have like, been involved with this for a good portion of their life, okay? You're not going to have the government taking its hands off of things. That's a pipe dream. It's a freaking fantasy. It's whatever, all right? But it would be nice if they actually did stuff right for content creators and entrepreneurs on the internet and protect things like net neutrality and understand fair use and uphold those things. And if you don't think that it's a problem, then you need to reference the court case that I brought up earlier, which was the 2007 through 2013-14 court decision 
in the lawsuit of Viacom International versus YouTube Inc. When Google acquired YouTube, read this, understand that we've been fighting copyright stuff with YouTube for about seven or eight years now, and that's where the copyright system came from, and that it was a problem, and that it went all the way through multiple courts. So you can't say, oh, stop having the government be involved because it's a big freaking problem. Okay? So let's, let's live in the real world. Let's live in the real world. Okay? Let's do that. So what I'm saying is, I want them to get it right because they're not going to take their hands off of it, so they need to do a better job. No one's begging them to do more whatever unless you're talking about some political stuff, in which case get off this channel. Like, I'm talking about business law at this point. I'm talking about business law. I'm talking about copyright law and trademark law and defamation and the stuff that content creators need to care about. Um, it's from switching screens and wire – like – it's what it's switching screens and wirecast is you're saying is where the audio thing yeah it is a little bit anyway let's move on and move to the other screen where i get to see some of your questions pop up um Peter, uh, Eric Peter Carlson, how are you? Filmmaker, awesome. Uh, Eric Peter Carlson is like a really dope filmmaker and he's also a Disney vlogger. Uh, he's saying, this will make it a lot easier than filling out forms every time someone uploads my videos on their own channel. Yup, couldn't agree uh, more. Couldn't agree more, that's the thing. Um, let me try adjusting some audio stuff here and see if that helps you guys out. All right, so maybe this is a little bit better. And let's try this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep, I think my audio should be better now. Um, and it's also, again, the distance. It's, you know. Um, bu -bu 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 yep, that's better. All right, cool. Yep. Uh, Smoothie Lay says a lot do not understand copyright laws and how it applies from state and inter, uh, interstate level and even abroad. Yep, it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, Michelle Johnson says this will dramatically affect certain niches like gaming and music review channels. Yes, probably. I know music review channels like to have clips from music and others. This will maybe, maybe not affect them. Uh, it might. It might not. It really depends. Um, in general, YouTube needs to do a better job of protecting channels like that that are the standard of um, fair use. Um, Subversive Asset says, I don't get why people keep saying this will force YouTube to implement fair use better. That is, and always will be a legal question it is for the sense that if content creators have more access to this tool it will mean that because they're creating a tool that allows for an action then they're much more responsible and thus like that's the that's where that youtube will have to step up comes in is because if they create a tool then they have to create a structure of supporting the tool accurately and pop uh, properly so that's definitely a thing and then um itana is right to be fair copyrights laws do change and vary from country to country which helps make it even more confusing but my understanding is also that the rights um, for the individual in the country of the copyright holder of origin take precedent is my understanding of it. I am 90% sure that that is the case. But I also cite the Viacom YouTube um, litigation when I reference that. And I'm not a lawyer, so disclaimer there. But my understanding of it, to the best of my ability, is this, is that Viacom filed in the District of New York and it was um, arbitrated in the District of New York because that's where Viacom is headquartered and they were the copyright holder. So I believe that that applies in the case of individuals as well. 
<clears throat> um, some versive uh, asset says YouTube is just a conduit. It's automating the process that people could already submit DCM takedowns. Now, instead of having to manually check, you get notified of potential violations. Absolutely, and you can act, um, execute from the platform level, so that makes a big difference. And um, facilitating that, though, even as a conduit, means that they have to make their policies clear, and that is important, and they actually have to enforce the policies of how they have things done through their system. So. That, um, I think, is where the, the idea of them doing fair use better uh, would come into play. That's my understanding of it. Um, so Subversive Asset says, so to the extent that someone disagrees with a takedown, it's still between the YouTuber who took down and the copyright claimant, um, whether that's Viacom or another YouTuber. Um, I, I would I would agree that that's probably the case. Um, again, not a lawyer. That's why I'm going to be interviewing some legal experts about this and GDRP and trademark and copyright on this channel so that they can give you guys a better understanding of this. And there are some great legal channels on YouTube that you should be watching. Um, Smoothie Lady Conduit represents middleman, more or less, if you want it in layman's terms, yes. Um, so again, I, I, I really... I believe in that and I believe in giving people the most education they can have around these issues, which actually brings us to um, a plug for me. So, and Anthony Steiner, I'm gonna get to you. Anthony Steiner is actually somebody who's in Awesome Creator Academy. So, uh, this broadcast is also brought to you by awesomecreatoracademy.com, which is my website, it's my business outside of YouTube, and it's an online education platform for influencers and entrepreneurs. Uh, I want you guys to have a business mindset about being an influencer and being an online content creator, and there's a lot I can help you with uh, in terms of that. If you want to join the Awesome Creator Academy mentoring group, uh, you can get more advice, more access to me and to the network of 100 other entrepreneurs and influencers in the group, and you can learn more about how to conduct what you're doing as a business, make more money, uh, grow your brand, grow your channel like Chris Boutte did, like Anthony Steiner is doing, like so many other people from the Create Awesome community have done. They've become part of Awesome Creator Academy. And so that is a monthly membership. Or if you just want to know how to make better videos um, so you don't have to make 100 videos that suck first like I did and bumble through it, you can take my course called The Formula for Awesome Videos. And that would definitely help you. Uh, or if you're a YouTube creator wanting to step up your branding and your game, you can get the YouTube Starter Kit. We have discount codes uh, and links for everything in the description down below. The YouTube Starter Kit has thumbnail templates, channel art templates that can help you make an awesome professional looking YouTube channel, get you more views, clicks, and subscribers. And you can find all of that at awesomecreatoracademy.com. Links are in the description down below as well as discount codes. Get them while it's hot. So uh, that's just you know a little housekeeping there and a plug for me and my business. And that's another way you can make money on YouTube is use it to market a business or a product that you already have. Anthony Steiner, $20 Super Chat. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Copyright. I've got two copyright infringement from public domain material. The channel had no way of proving that they were the original owners of the material over 100 years ago, but still claimed it is um, two strikes. Okay, so one, definitely um, do an appeal on those strikes and reference the material that proves that they're public domain, but also verify that the public domain still exists on those things and that the public domain didn't expire and that wasn't acquired by another company because it's possible that someone acquired the rights. Um, I've been actually looking into how to acquire the rights of certain things or how to license the rights of certain things. So look into that because that could be um, really important. Um, and it might be that you've accidentally used something that someone bought rights to that used to be public domain or that the domain expired and they acquired it. Or it could be that you have a great case for um, fighting that and getting an appeal. So I would definitely um, do that. Um, sorry, it's GDPR, GDPR, not GDRP, GDPR. It's a it's a hard acronym, but there's some stuff that came out of Europe that affects people doing online business that is really important that I need to get legal people to talk about. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot to cover with uh, you know fair use, copyright, 
trademark, um, all of these things. And, and, and it's, and, and, you know, um, it's a bigger conversation that needs to be opened up and I cannot wait to bring on legal experts, legal eagles to talk about this. People like my friend Jonathan Katz, people like um, my friend Mitch Jackson, um, people like my friend, um, you know, Brittany Hoffman. Like there's, there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, oh, compliments on the, the, um, the lights. Um, and positively, Udo, you're saying you're trying to join it, but uh, it won't let you put in your payment information. Um, try doing it from another browser and see if that helps. Um, also, uh, check this out. So I just changed the lights. The reason I muted is I didn't want to trigger anybody's Apple devices in the replay or during the live, but there you go. I just, you know, I can do that. Uh, in fact, um, I'll change it back because I kind of like the purple. I'm digging the purple. Okay, there you go. All right, so that's pretty dope. At some point, I might actually rig it so that when you guys super chat, these lights change in proportion to the color of the super chats. Hi Roberto, regarding DTube, do you think that they have new serious copyright issues on the horizon due to it being non-restrictive and uncensored? How could we best maneuver for this potential threat? I think that it's possible that with DTube and Steemit, if they refuse to regulate the content because they're trying to be anti-YouTube and pro-free speech on that, it's possible that Viacom or somebody could end up filing a lawsuit very similar to the lawsuit from 2007 um, that was filed against YouTube and Google. Um, now, I don't know if that's the case because I'm not a lawyer, but I'd imagine it's something that could happen and it's troubling to me. Competition should exist, but if people start uploading copyrighted material to DTube and to Steam it, Viacom and companies like it, Viacom and all the music industry people, they will come after them and like they'll be within their legal rights, I'm sure. So I imagine that if they were able to come after YouTube and get concessions from YouTube, it, it, they'll, they'll have to go there. And so um, I, I think that's a thing. I think that's a thing. Um, yeah, I have Philips Hue bulbs as well. So yeah, that if anyone's wondering about the smart home stuff, Um, Extreme Trends asks, how do movie list channels such as Screen Rant and Looper get away with using clips of TV shows and movies without copyright issues? I'd imagine that, one, I, I do feel they are protected under fair use, but I would also imagine that either their multi-channel network that they own or the one that they're a part of um, will be the the legal entity that concessioned some licensing or permissions to do that um so i mean you can you it's easier to get away with certain things when you're a bigger entity and when you try to secure those rights because it is possible and i know that there are bigger youtube channel reviewers they don't talk about it but they actually worked with the copyright holders and media companies to get proper permissions to do this stuff so that's real I mean, yeah, I get that DTube is decentralized, and but they also are a company and they're incorporated. So it's the incorporated company, it's the owners. It's, it, it can be decentralized, but whoever owns the domain, the server for the initial website, those things are considered um, a facilitator, if you will. And so the... Again, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding of how that works is that they're not safe. So don't think for, like, if I, in my opinion, don't think for one minute that Viacom wouldn't find a way or another company like Viacom or something. In my opinion, if I'm Viacom, believe me, I'd find a way to get them. If it's me, if it was me, if I have that kind of money and I've got billions of dollars and I'm a media company and people are pirating my stuff, game over. Good night, Irene. You know, so 
I understand and I respect what, what DTube and Steemit are trying to do. I'm looking into them more. Um, I'm looking into some of these blockchain things and I'm thinking of becoming an investor in some of them with you know taking something and investing and getting in early. Um, but don't think that they're invulnerable. Don't think for one minute that they're invulnerable. You know. So that's what I would say. Um, yeah, uh, reviewers are mostly protected under fair use because uh, a large amount of it um, is not the majority of the content and they're doing original work and there's enough of it that's commentary. And uh, so, yes. Um, and Matt made, yes, I know those are highly speculative investments. That's why I won't go big. Um, you know, that's why I just wouldn't go big on those. But yeah, uh, I think I got all the super chat questions. Um, and I think we, we covered a lot of ground here. I think there's a lot that people understand better now that we've gone over it with regard to, you know, copyright and fair use. And again, for those of you who want to use music, I want to remind you, we have an affiliate link, but uh, Epidemic Sounds is where I've been getting a lot of the music for the channel lately. Um, so Epidemic Sounds, 30 day free trial. Guys, it's a free trial. Grab this, see if you like it for your music and for your editing, but it's free. It's 30 days for free with my affiliate link. It does help out the channel, it helps me out, but you guys get it for free and you get some of the awesome tracks. Like I'm looking at this stuff and I'm stepping up my game with some of the product review videos. I'm using this stuff with some of the motivational stuff I'm using this and it's been working out really good and you guys have responded well to it. So Epidemic Sounds guys, there's the link. I've also linked it up in the description for you and get 30 days free, 30 days free. Um, Fire Desire Entertainment says, I just got my Steemit account approved and so DTube is opening up to me as an option. I've spent the last week reading and watching videos, finding a, uh, my way around before I start posting. Nice. That's awesome. Oh uh, yeah, Les is in Awesome Creator Academy also. That's pretty cool. Um, we've got a lot of people from Awesome Creator Academy on the stream here. Uh, Fire Desire chat. Uh, Fire Desire Entertainment says, "I need to educate myself more on this, but it looks like a great opportunity." Thanks again for this live stream. No super chat available for me in South Africa. Oh, they need to get on that. Would love to donate to you. They need to get on that. They need to get on that. Fire uh, Fire Desire Entertainment. If you um, just want to say thank you to me, but also get something really dope in return, and you can't do a super chat, and this goes for anyone else, if you can't do a super chat, but you want to support what I'm doing, then look at possibly grabbing the YouTube starter kit over on Awesome Creator Academy. I have links in the description and you can use the discount code YouTube Smart and get a discount on that. Um, you guys will get over 160 downloads to help you jazz up your YouTube thumbnails, your YouTube channel artwork with templates, end screens, lower thirds, and more. You'll also get some um, great information and other resources in the YouTube starter kit. It's usually 99 bucks, but we have a discount code called YouTube Smart. If you want to support me and you can't do super chat, um, or you really just want to get the awesome assets from the YouTube starter kit, then you can grab that with the link in the description and use the discount code YouTube Smart. That is awesomecreatoracademy.com. That supports me, that supports the channel. Um, that's one of my products that I developed to be independent from YouTube. Um, because again, one of the messages that I always give you guys is be independent from YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever platform you're using for content. I always tell you guys, build your own websites, build your own email list, have access to your community, do a podcast, own your content fully, own your community relationships fully, and don't rely entirely on the platform. Wow, is it raining that hard out there? Oh, wow. I might need to secure some things if it's storming like that. Anyway, um, that's it. And that's thunder. Okay. 
Well, I'm going to try and wrap up this stream uh, before the storm hits uh, because that could be problematic. Um, <laughs> that could be problematic. Um, yes, I agree with um, Itana that when you use copyright material, you need to accept that there's a risk even if you believe it's fair use. Um, I agree with that. Uh, if you make something like that, you got to be willing to accept that maybe it um, doesn't work out and maybe you make zero money on it. Dragon Lord Lita, that's a dope name. Uh, do you think that this will dramatically affect channels that create music videos based on movie clips and sync into music? This new tool and what they do afterward, I don't think so. I think that this will have more to do with anybody doing um, YouTube commentary, YouTube news, um, YouTube drama, YouTube response videos, things of that nature. But where it will affect more with the music channels and other things is this. Where it will affect it more is I personally believe that there are smaller media companies that haven't been able to get YouTube content ID that will use this tool. The difference is at least if it's a media company that doesn't have YouTube content ID and they're using this tool, they won't take your monetization, but they could take down your video. That is almost as bad, if not worse, in some ways. So that's where my concern becomes for that. Because, for example, I have an actual media company and it's not big enough to do YouTube content ID apparently yet, although I'm applying again. But... It would mean that I could take down somebody who reposts an episode of my podcast or of my audiobook, but I wouldn't be able to just do a content claim and get the money from it. But I'd be able to take down the video. You know what I mean? So that's, that's where I see media companies and businesses could potentially take down videos that use their copyrighted materials um, versus um, like as far as the type of channels you're talking about. So um, that's what I'm looking at. Um, Zach, you're not blocked. I'm seeing your comments. I don't know what's going on on your end. You just may not be in the top. I'm doing top chat, so maybe you don't see it. I don't know. But like I see your stuff, Zach. So I don't. I don't know. Um, all things Nelly says. Re reaction videos will be. Yeah, re reaction videos will probably be hit. Reaction videos will probably be hit. Um, Melissa Amsler says I wanted to do a response video to give my opinions, but I didn't include clips from the video. Would someone be able to use that approach going forward with the new tools? I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. Now, here's something I will say. If somebody is using clips and they edit your clips out of context and they do commentary, even if that's fair use, you should still be able to take down that video for copyright abuse because it's defamatory and it's slander or libel. And I would rather you do that than pursue a lawsuit because it'll cost you money, it'll cost them money, and it might get mainstream attention that makes YouTube look bad. But that's my personal feelings. Do what your lawyer says in that situation. Do whatever your lawyer says. But I'd rather that if somebody makes a slanderous video about your company, your business, you as a creator, and it's outright lies and you could have a defamation suit, the short-term thing is to basically do the equivalent of a cease and desist, in my opinion, um, by taking down the video for using your stuff without permission um, and that's an accurate takedown in that particular situation based on what my understanding is at least that's fair because the alternative is you'd sue them so I think that that's the right thing yeah I mean you get what I'm saying like so that's real because like I mean, he doesn't probably care as much, maybe, or maybe he does. I can't speak for him. But, like, let's say it was, like, 
like, I'm going to get lawyers to talk about the slander thing because they can do it with substance and legally they, they're allowed to. But, like, my, my answer is this, is, like, let's say somebody made a, a truly slanderous, outright lies and bad, like, video about PewDiePie, right? I think he'd be within his rights if someone made a video like what the Wall Street Journal did, for example, to some extent. Like, they said things about him and put him in a context that wasn't true. If someone edited, if a media company or a YouTuber edited a video out of context using footage of PewDiePie without using the entire context of the video, edited it, used his material, did it to say that he is X, Y, or Z, and that's not true, and it was purposely modified to look that way, I would say that without being a lawyer, I would, if I'm him, I'm calling a lawyer and I'm suing the crap out of them. If I'm him. You know what I mean? But um, he even brought up that he might do that with Vice based on something they did, right? Like, but I think he just made a video roasting them instead was my understanding. But I mean, that's the way YouTubers choose to handle things or not. But like, from a business standpoint, if somebody makes media content painting falsehoods about you as an individual or an incorporated company, and a lot of YouTubers are incorporated companies now, this becomes a problem. I'd just rather they copyright strike videos than have large lawsuits for the mainstream media to start talking more smack about YouTube, but that's just how I feel about it. You know what I mean? So, like, that's where I'm going with some of this. Um, so, like, cease and desist copyright strike it but if it gets to the point to where it's necessary to do a lawsuit i guess it just is but like i'm uncomfortable there you know um j marco gaming channels i don't think things will get worse for them than they already are um but i don't know you know um i think for gaming channels things will say Things will stay much the same, but I do want to cop. I want I want to cover something. And I want to bring up YouTube's policy. And I want to read it out loud. By the way, guys, do you want me to do not today? Clearly not today. Do you guys want me to do a YouTube live stream where I just read YouTube policies out loud? Do you guys want a long video where I just read YouTube policies out loud? Because I could do that. Like, I could do that, and it might be helpful. I, I don't know. Maybe. Because I, I think that maybe some people, there's just certain things people don't get. And maybe that would make a difference. Um, but I'm going to try to help you understand the difference between what a content claim is and what a, a copyright strike is, at least in, in the terms that... Um, YouTube says so I mean let's dig into this a little bit real quick <clears throat> what is a YouTube, uh, what is a content ID claim and this by the way can be found in the support section of YouTube and Google and um, they have some copyright strike basics and things you need to know what is a content ID claim if you upload a video that contains copyrighted material, you could end up with a content ID claim. These claims are issued by companies that own music, movies, TV shows, video games, or other copyrighted material. Now I'm going to caveat here. If someone's using something like Collab DRM, they also could have a claim filed on their behalf for them to get the money from that thing. So just keep that in mind. Content owners can set content ID to block material from YouTube when a claim is made. You can also allow the video to remain live on YouTube with ads. In those cases, the advertising revenue goes to the copyright holders of the claimed content. So as you can see, that is different than a copyright strike. A copyright strike negatively impacts your YouTube channel three strikes in a row and your channel could be deleted by YouTube or suspended by YouTube. Um, and 
that's usually reserved for you uploading or repurposing uh, content maliciously in, in uh, that's owned by another copyright holder without editing or without meeting transformative guidelines, etc. But alternatively, with a copyright claim, your video could just be blocked or taken down without it issuing a strike that hurts your channel. And it could just be claimed and the video could stay up, but you wouldn't make money and the copyright holder would make money. So that's the primary difference here. Where do I see my content ID claims? To see if you have any content ID claims for your videos, go to the copyright notices section of your YouTube manage, video manager. Um, we may also email you uh, if you get a content ID claim if your video account is affected. Am I in trouble? Probably not. In most cases, getting a content ID claim isn't a bad thing for your YouTube channel. It just means, hey, we found some content in your video that's owned by somebody else. It is up to the copyright holders to decide whether or not users can reuse their original material. In many cases, copyright owners allow their content to be used in YouTube videos in exchange for having ads run on those videos. These ads may play before a video or during it if the video is longer than 10 minutes. However, there are some actions copyright owners can take if they don't want their material reused. Blocking a video. Sometimes copyright owners may block your video, which means people won't be allowed to watch it. They can decide to block your video worldwide or just in certain countries. This is important because of copyright laws that apply in the US versus other places in the world. Muting a video. If your video contains copyrighted protected music, the owner may choose to mute it. This means that people can watch your videos, but they won't be able to hear the soundtrack. Blocking certain platforms. Sometimes copyright owners may restrict the devices, apps, or websites that their content can appear. These restrictions won't change the availability of videos on YouTube.com. In some cases, you can't monetize a video that has a content ID claim. Instead, the copyright owners can choose to monetize your video. But in other cases, like mu if music is claimed in your video, you may be able to share the advertising revenue with the music's copyright owners. What can I do about this claim? You can choose to do nothing. If you agree with the claim, you can move on. You can always change your mind later if you disagree with the claim. Remove the music. If you get a claim for a piece of music on your video, you can try to remove the music without having to edit and upload your video. And there are tools to do that. Uh, if the music in your video is claimed but you still want to have music in the background, you can swap out the audio track with one of our free to use songs. Or alternatively, you can use um, Epidemic Sounds. Link in the description. <laughs> Share revenue. If you're a member of the YouTube Partner Program and if you included music in your video, you may be able to share revenue with the music rights holders. Dispute the claim. If you have the required rights to use the copyright, co copyright protected content on your video, let's say for example you have a license, you bought a license for a company or a company granted you a license but it's still getting flagged because you weren't whitelisted, or if you think the system has somehow misidentified your video, you can dispute the claim. How to dispute a content claim? Sign into YouTube, go to the YouTube Creator Studio Video Manager, go to Copyright Notices, click the link to the right of a video's uh, edit menu. That will take you to a page about information about what's been claimed on your video and who claimed it. You'll see an option to dispute the claim. If you dispute a claim without a valid reason, the content owner may choose to take down your video. If this happens, your account will get a copyright strike. All right, so there you have it. That is how copyright claim works on YouTube. So now you should have a much better understanding of how copyright claim works on YouTube, what your rights are, what you can do about it, and uh, how it impacts you as a creator. So yeah, at some point I think I will um, read these policies in different videos out loud. And by the way, could somebody watch the replay and kind of like make some cool timestamps for uh, for things in the replay? Because that'd be dope for me. That would help.
because uh, it's hard to take notes and do the live stream. Um, you know. Andrew, you're based in Atlanta? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this storm is no joke. This storm's pretty bad. Um, I don't know if I agree with the three strikes rule on YouTube, to be, in, to be honest with you. Um, the three strikes and then your channel's deleted. I don't know if I agree with that rule. That was one of the concessions that came out of the Viacom litigation, is my understanding. Um, but I don't know if I agree with that rule. Um, maybe five, you know. So, you know. Haunted Road Media says, also an important note, just because a band gave you permission to use their music doesn't mean you will get you won't get hit by a claim on YouTube. The label or publishing company may hold that right. For those of you who are gamers, this is super important. The gaming companies aren't always hitting you guys with the copyright thing. It might be the music company that the gaming company licensed from. That license doesn't transfer to you. So what I tell YouTube gamers is to go into the settings of their video game and to turn off the muse, the background music, and you might have to buy an Astro mixer, and then you can run your own music while the game is running. So if there's music, if you are like, oh, but it's boring without music, so you know, there's that. Um, I'll take a few more questions for like five minutes. I'll prioritize super chat questions and anybody who does a super chat. But I'll do a little bit of Q and A, and then I'm gonna run because uh, that storm is getting very real. And I might need to secure some things that are outside. Um, and also I want to eat something. Because, uh, yeah, um, I didn't do lunch earlier, so there's that. Also, again, reminder, Epidemic Sounds. If you need copyright free music, and you can get a 30-day free trial with this link. And, yes, that is an affiliate link. So thanks, FTC. Uh, yes, like, you know, I'm disclosing that. But, like, the reality is I love this. I use it. Uh, I've been using it for a long time now. And it's one of the multiple things I pay for to get dope music. Um, in addition to the fact that I am going to probably hire someone to do some scoring for me for exclusive music. But in the meantime, I use Epidemic Sounds. Um, in the last couple of videos, that's what I've been using. Uh, get a free trial, 30 days and see if you like it and if you like it keep it and make dope videos with copyright free music that won't get claimed or striked um eliminate uh mr musgrove is uh saying they use his audio blocks slash story blocks i use them too i'm actually working on some stuff for that um yeah i use everybody Uh, Devin Street says he doesn't think that you should have rights taken away like thumbnails and streaming for the first strike. Um, maybe. I, I, that's debatable for me. The reason is I think it's a deterrent, so I understand why that exists. Um, I think some things um, exist as a deterrent. Um, WGBS, um, definitely check out Epidemic and see if you like it. It's a free trial, so just grab the free trial if nothing else. It's free, right? You know, so there's no harm. I would encourage you guys if there's a free trial for something, always, you know, check out the free trial because it's free. If you don't like it, no skin, no foul, right? So I always like trying out free stuff. I tried most of the things that I have that I pay for. I tried them for free before I bought them, and I liked them enough to like commit to them, and that's what I did. Um. So I'm a big fan of free trials. Um, I mean, it's the same thing I tell you guys with Adobe stuff is if you if you want to check out Adobe, you know, get a free trial, see if you like it, see if you can use it. I mean, even Final Cut Pro has a free trial. So, you know. Um, let's see if we got any more questions. 
So if you get a claim for any song but don't get banned, can the music owner ban you later? Um, because they own the copyright, they can rescind the usage rights. So technically, yes. So Camo10 asked that question, yeah. Um, they, they have the rights, so they can enact those rights later at another point, yes. Any music holder, any copyright holder can enforce their rights at any time, even if they've granted prior permission. That's my understanding. I'm not a lawyer, but that's what I've seen happen. That's why um, a lot of us, me, Nick Nimmin, Brian G. Johnson, um, a lot of us um, tell you do 100% um, original content as best as you can with uh, material that you own as best as you can. And the reason we, we often say that is because it helps you avoid the majority of these kinds of issues. Um, so in the long run, it's just a safer bet at the end of the day. Um, and that's why you know a lot of us will tell you that. And I know it might not let you make the wildest, zaniest thing in the world sometimes, but it's the thing that if you care about making money on YouTube or you don't want your video to get taken down, it's the thing that keeps you the safest. So, you know, that's usually why we say that. Um, all right. So anyway, guys, um, unless there are more questions, this is pretty much, we're rounding out the end of the stream here at two hours. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us on the live stream. I also wanna thank our friends at TubeBuddy. If you guys uh, have not checked out TubeBuddy, they are amazing. Go to TubeBuddy.com slash awesome. Uh, plans start at $9.00. $19 and $39 a month for TubeBuddy. They've got an insane feature set that has really helped me grow my YouTube channel. But we've got a 20% off discount code for you guys in the description down below. Um, Roberto's Buddy, they are the sponsors of our live stream today. So thank you to Phil and Andrew and the rest of the TubeBuddy team for supporting what we do here on the channel. Thank you for them supporting us on Awesome Creator Academy as well and on the podcast. You know, so um, absolutely would definitely encourage you guys to use TubeBuddy. You know it's my secret weapon. You know that I've actually used the features in TubeBuddy to help me with everything from video SEO to bulk processing of things, my data and research. It's like really helped me out. I'm even using it and now experimenting with the translations tool to help my international community, at least where the titles and descriptions of my videos are concerned, aside from my closed captioning. We've got all kinds of YouTube resources for you guys in the description down below. Uh, so definitely make sure you're checking that out. And thank you again to TubeBuddy for sponsoring us. Um, definitely really appreciate them supporting creators and supporting us. Uh, they also are going to be the sponsor for my meetup at VidCon this June, June 21st. I'm doing a meetup where you guys can see me. You can ask questions if you're gonna be at VidCon on the creator's floor. Come see me at the TubeBuddy booth on the 21st right after my talk. It is gonna be amazing. Uh, it's gonna be a fun time. I might actually have some uh, always be creating and create something awesome today shirts to give away to you guys. I might have some coupons to give away or some even some people might win uh, some of my products for free. So uh, definitely would um, encourage you guys to come out to the meetup and come to VidCon and hear me uh, speak at one of my sessions. All right, so um, that's it you guys for today's YouTube live Q&A. Thank you guys for the tremendous questions. Uh, make sure you're checking out the replay. That'll be available in a few hours. I may or may not have another upload today. Please turn on notifications. Please check the channel every day to see if I'm uploading. Uh, definitely follow me over on Twitter and Instagram to see if I'm uploading and also check out other dope content uh, from me. And also don't forget to check out awesomecreatoracademy.com. That is my online platform for um, education, 
for influencers and entrepreneurs. So we got a lot of great resources at awesomecreatoracademy.com. Some of it's paid. Don't forget to get our free analytics training video for YouTube by signing up your email. Also, we have a blog with great free articles. You also can become an affiliate. If you decide to become an affiliate and help sell anything from the YouTube starter kit or the Formula for Awesome videos or coaching, there's a 30% affiliate commission if you um, help sell that stuff. And so that's an opportunity for you guys to make money. So if you believe in the YouTube Starter Kit and you've used it, or you've taken the Formula for Awesome Videos courses, or you uh, respect me as a coach, you can become an affiliate. You can sell those products with a link and make some money on the side. So definitely make sure you're checking out awesomecreatoracademy.com for details. Link is in the description down below, you guys. Anyway, my name is Roberto Blake. I've enjoyed talking with you guys today. And just remember, go out there and create something awesome today. Take care.